Okay, so I have a, a very pleasant mission, same as last year, to just move the microphone around, and I hope you will have some thought-provoking questions to our dear guests. So, uh, oh, actually, maybe I should start. I have a, I have a, I'm curious about a uh, performance that you did, the uh, beautiful dance that you, did, that you did yesterday. But before that, before actually starting, you were, you were doing some performance art with your shoes, oh, right? Performance art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, like, my, my question is, like, what was, like what was the meaning of that maybe? Okay. Even if it even ever had any meaning. Yes. And the other question is like, what can you say about the shoes in general that you use on the social dance floor or when you're teaching and performing and stuff? Because that's the question that interests most leads at least to yes. because uh, the shoes are kind of important. Yes. Good question from the beginning of the talk, but yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you, Alina. Hello? Now I can use my sexy voice. Uh, so, yeah, the beginning of my performance, uh, it was a, it was kind of a, I mean, it, it was a last minute thing, I just thought about it in the moment. Because I was literally trying to figure out which shoes I should use, because the old shoes are more slippery. And I don't necessarily prefer this uh, marley floor. I like to have wood because I like to slide. I do a lot of things sliding my feet. And so I like the floor to be a little bit slippery, a little fast. So the other shoes I had are new shoes. And the new shoes, the leather is still uh, very sticky. And with the marley, it didn't allow me to slide as much. But uh, more than that, it was uh, kind of a me rebelling against the idea that I'm supposed to have very bright, brand new, shiny looking shoes or a, or a shiny looking outfit or costume or, uh, you know, I, I rebel against that. I, I wore a t-shirt and sweatpants and, and I danced with my dirty old shoes, you know? And so I, I threw them away as though I was saying, you know, I, I'm not gonna conform to what you think or what people have told me is supposed to be how I'm supposed to get on stage to present myself uh, because the dance will speak for me, not to the clothing that I'm wearing. So, so yeah, it was, I was asking the audience to help me decide and then I made the decision to go with the, the old shoes that have more of my soul and more of my work and more of my uh, essence in them and, and to discard the ones that I thought I might need to wear to be presentable for the audience. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. What about other shoes that you have? Oh. <laughs> I thought you were going to translate that. In the Russian, please. Uh, no, so I, I, uh, I like to be able to slide. Uh, I train in sh the, sh the shoes that I, in the ballet slippers because they allow me to feel the ground because of all the things that I said in the classes about uh, producing everything from the ground and uh, understanding the process of using the foot, and so I like to feel the ground. But once you understand that, you can dance in anything. Uh, and I've danced in flip-flops, I've danced in knees, I've danced in uh, boots. Uh, I, uh, you know, I've, once you understand what it is that the floor is trying to teach you, then you can apply that anywhere and you're not compromised. But if you're trying to learn to get in touch with the floor compromised, you're going to distort your development and it will affect you later. You know? So, so I just, I, I, what I do now is uh, I carry my ballet shoes because I'm wearing these Jesus sandals uh, going through a, a caveman phase in my life. So I'm trying to be closer to nature, closer to the way, uh, you know, the, the things are supposed to be. 
And, uh, but, um, so I carry my ballet shoes with me and I will dance socially with my ballet shoes. Uh, but when the winter comes, I'll be dancing in whatever I have on my feet. If the floor compromises me, it's okay because it, I, I go with the flow and I understand the floor and my relationship to it and so it changes the way I'm able to manifest what I'm manifesting. Depending on what I'm wearing, I know I can't do, I can't play with my feet the same way that I can if it were slippery. Or if I'm wearing flip-flops that move around, I have to change the way that I'm using my body. But, um, but yeah, I don't, uh, I don't need anything specific at this point uh, to dance and, and have a good dance. It, the circumstances always dictate the dance for me. It's, it's important that uh, I not try to, for me, I not try to create uh, circumstance, but to uh, be able to conform to whatever the flow is at that moment. And I feel that about life, you know, that we, we do a lot of trying to make things in our life the way we think they're supposed to be. And then we deal with issues because we will eventually find that life doesn't care what we think about what it's supposed to be. So uh, I like to practice that with the, uh, with the dance, you know, if, if the conditions are a certain way, I have to find a way to be part of that flow. What is the mambo of that? particular circumstance, you know, if I can't move my feet, then what happens now? What's the mambo going to look like now? Uh, that's part of my, my practice. Okay, so so you prefer, like, slippery floor, yes, as like long as it's con uh, con uh, as controlled. As right. Yeah, okay. As long as I'm not, my life is controlled. Okay. Can I ask? Yeah, actually about shoes. We met Frank at the airport, it was so cold. And we kind of partied hard before, and we were like at 9 a.m. And we see Frank in, in Jesus' shoes, and we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have uh, many, many questions to you, but I don't know where to choose. Uh, first of all, we have a new guest this year, it's Josette Wigan representing jazz culture, black culture. And I think you're all very curious about her experience, how she came to a point being top jazz step dancer. Yeah, and uh, I would love to just to ask you how you came to that, what is your experience, what was your path, how you started, what teachers inspired you, yeah, do you know about it, and so on, whatever you want to say. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm tough. I'm just still learning, still trying to feel better. Being tough. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many dancers who are still my inspiration. Who, but I, I will go back to the beginning. But um, to make a long story short, I started at 12 at a dance studio in Los Angeles called Universal Dance Design. I danced for two months, and then my brother Joseph would, would come with my mom to pick me up, and he would learn a step at the end of the class because he didn't want to join the class. He was curious, <laughs> but they were all girls. We were all girls, so he was just, okay, learned a step from the teacher at the end of my class. And then eventually, that went on for some months, and eventually we were both put into this kid group called the... I don't even remember the name of our company. It's a Kennedy Tap Company or something like this. And then with this company, that's where our performance um, abilities actually were pushed to the max because we would perform on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. <laughs> this is a production. There's, there's theme music, everything. It's incredible. Different parts of our story have different theme music. Yesterday I messed up the cabaret, he messes up the Oscar music when your speech is too long. I got the cue, but I understand. I will make it concise. Yes, I will I will short it. So we started dancing. <laughs> we started 
started performing <laughs> on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday. Sometimes we would have two shows a day. And just performing as kids, you know, every single weekend just really taught us. Our teacher was an uh, excellent teacher in the sense that in rehearsals, we had to walk on to the rehearsal floor as if there, it was a performance. So he would make us practice walking on and standing, you know, in our positions. And if someone scratched, we had to leave and come back again to stand. Oh, I see your eye twitching. We had to like, keep our eyes open. So this kind of taught us that the second you begin, the second you walk on stage, it's a performance. And that helped push our performing abilities. And so we did that for a while. And then I ventured into an adult tap company called Jazz Tap Ensemble. And then from there, we met Jason Sammy Smith, who unfortunately I didn't get to work with him that often because I left and did another production, but my brother really worked with him for a while. But he was the first person who kind of pushed us into improvisation and got us actually really trying to find our voice and to create our own um, identity as tap dancers and not you know, do just choreography and steps and routines. And then from there, it's kind of a mishmash. Um, Domitia Sambri Edwards also grew up at a studio, so she would always come back and do workshops. Derek Grant, he would come every summer as a kid. Um, and then from as an adult, he would come back and do workshops as well. So these are just some of the influences who kind of catapulted our curiosity and um, just pushed us along. To, they kind of set the bar for us as what excellence could be. And we were trying to um, get close to to the level that they set. And from there, it just, I didn't expect this to be a career. It was just something that I loved. And it just happened to turn into a career because I never stopped dancing. And um, I did 42nd Street, the Broadway tour, and when I was 19. And then from there, Raquette, then I got injured. Um, they're the Radio City. I don't know if you know, they stand in the line and do kicks and things like that. And then <laughs> <laughs> from there, um, I did um, Cirque du Soleil's first musical theater venture called Banana Spill, and it flopped. It was the first show to ever close. And then 20 something year history of Cirque du Soleil. They never closed the show, and this show closed. <laughs> and then six months later, we got a call to um, try out for their Michael Jackson show. And this one was actually successful, and we toured with it for two and a half years. And so we did a total of four years with the company. And then I decided that I had to make a decision either I would stay with the company and be a Cirque machine or leave and continue to work on my artistry. And so I decided in 2013 to leave, get married, start a life, and continue to get better. And so this is where I'm at now, still trying to figure out my path and my journey. But that's the whole thing is uh, as quickly as I can say. <laughs> so, about Michael Jackson World Tour because we had uh, the previous year in 2015 and 14 we had Chester Whitmore who is now tapping over there in the corner in Casa Latina. <laughs> yeah, he's a legend and uh, I know that he also he's also your teacher. Yeah, and uh, he has uh, many connections with Michael Jackson as well and people are like asking us more about Michael Jackson. Yeah, so um, could you speak on him and on your experience working in that company and what it meant to you and like something like that? <laughs> so unfortunately, Michael had already passed when we did this show. It was a collaboration between his estate. Michael Jackson's not alive? <laughs> <laughs> as far as we know. <laughs> he might be somewhere on an island, you know, having <laughs> Yeah. He's in St. Petersburg now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 
and it was a collaboration between his estate, so his lawyers, um, his costume designers, his lighting people, his choreographers, his, like, all of his new musicians, the original drummer, um, who he even drummed with them from the 70s when they were in the Jackson 5, and um, some of the singers. So it's pretty much Michael's team collaborating with Cirque du Soleil. And they hired nine different choreographers to put um, to choreograph the entire show. And so the process was quite intense because you had Travis Payne, who was his main choreographer one day, and then you had, you know, Rich and Tone, who also dance with him but are now choreographers as well. And so every day you dealt with different personalities, different choreography, different ways of working, and it was pretty intense. But um, I have to say, overall, I wouldn't change it. They also taught us, I mean, three months. It took three months before Joseph and I even put on our tap shoes. And so we forgot, you know, we were wondering, like, did they forget that we're tap dancers? <laughs> we were in harnesses, flying and doing this uh, hoop called uh, Lyra or Sarso. And so I was in this hoop and getting bruises and working on my flexibility and I was crying every day, calling my mom. I think it means I can tap this what is he what is like what with me here? I don't do this. But I had to push and work and make myself look like these other people who you know, this is what they do. I I was in line with contortionists. So I had to look like I was a contortionist. So it really gave me the skill to learn that sometimes you have to just jump in and give it your all. And if you push, you can do it. And so this experience really taught me that, that um, when you're under pressure and the stakes are high, you either crumble or you rise. And if you just push through it, you can rise. You, we underestimate ourselves sometimes. And so this experience taught me that. And then finally, we had to have a talk. We were like, Joseph, you know, we talked amongst ourselves. We would check in, like, do you still want to stay? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to go? Yeah, I want to go. So we would have these talks, like, should we quit? Should we stay? Should we quit? And so finally we decided to stay. And we went to the director, and we just kind of pushed it. You know, we're tap dancers. <laughs> when, when are we going to work on the tap section? Like, oh, yeah, we're going to get to it. And when we did, in a two-hour show, we tapped about 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> And then they gave us another little like ending transition. So the whole thing together was about a minute in two hours. So we were not tapping much. But we learned a lot. And we have friends from this cast that we'll have for the rest of our lives. And we learned a lot about discipline and training watching these other acrobats. They risk their lives every night. They put their lives on the line. And so the precision and the discipline are maintaining their bodies and just being exact and precise with your movement every single night. Sometimes we had two shows a day, and they still couldn't mess up, you know. Sometimes you're tapping and you're like, ah, I'm tired, I'll just do my shuffle, like, no, no, no. You know, a hand balancer can't do that. She has to be precise, and he has to be precise every single time. So now I'm trying to apply that to my uh, tapping as well, the precision aspect. And you don't have the leniency to miss a shuffle, to miss a toe, to miss a heel this time. Because an acrobat doesn't have that leniency. So now I'm taking this discipline and applying it to my craft as well. And so overall, this experience has taught me that excellence is excellence. It doesn't matter what you do. And we should all kind of try our hardest to strive towards that. Валера, скажи что-нибудь. I took over the job, Валера. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Лучше модератор, который молчит. Давайте, задайте какой-то вопрос, а то я сейчас буду задавать. Наверняка у вас есть. Лучше вы, да. Ну, кто смелый? Пожалуйста. Ну, ладно, напишай. Все ясно. Давай, ты. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm clean. <laughs> okay. Ah. It's for Frankie. It's just to know uh, with 
which kind of dance you start to learn at the beginning of your career? Muy bien con el inglés. The Barcelona ladies here. Uh, I, I, the first dance that I did formally was Mambo with Eddie Torres. The only dance that I've done formally is, is Mambo with Eddie Torres. Uh, my youth was spent, uh, my youth meaning like 20 years from the time that I was nine years old was spent in traditional martial arts. Uh, I danced my entire life, but I didn't study it formally. I won dance competitions when I was 13 years old. I won, uh, this is gonna show my age, but. <laughs> I, uh, I was 13 I, at a school dance. I won a freestyle dance competition and the prize was a Cool Modi 12 inch single. That was my DJ. Yeah. Cool Modi is a rap artist. From the 80s. <laughs> from the 80s and 12 inch. <laughs> 12 inch singles <laughs> were records, albums, vinyl, that were, it was a single, it was the one song, but there was like 12 versions of the song, all the remixes, the, the James Brown remix, the, the, the Funk Master Flex remix, the Pete Rock remix, the, the so yeah, I, I danced at my family, we always had Latin music uh, family gatherings, there was always uh, Little Merengue and Salsa with family. Um, I had an affinity for dance. I figured that out in my teens in terms of just dancing on the street and being stupid. I tried out uh, to be in a break dance contest uh, and I didn't make it because I only did the worm, which is, uh, do I have to show you the worm? I don't know if I can do it anymore. It's not a great move. <laughs> it's a very stupid move. But you know, this one. <laughs> That's all I knew. <laughs> so I didn't get accepted. But I was very young. I was very young. Yeah, but it was that was that time where the cardboard boxes and people break dancing in the street and stuff like that. So, um, but uh, yeah, I, I had an affinity. I remember my first girlfriend ever. She knew me as a dancer because I, that's when I was doing these little uh, freestyle things in the dance, uh, the school dances. But my. Um, my physical training is from martial arts, and my reference for physical training is from martial arts. My spiritual outlook is from martial arts. My life view is from martial arts. And uh, at a certain point in my life, I had given up martial arts for dance. And many people asked me, don't you miss it? Do you still do karate? People ask me that all the time. Do you still do karate? I also am a Zen Buddhist. I've been into Zen since I was uh, 16 years old. My first karate instructor introduced me to Zen Buddhism as the next step in my training and what I was doing. Uh, and I had to uh, deal with that in my life, the fact that I had left something so profound and so serious for something that was so seemingly trivial and superficial. And because salsa in the nightclubs is pretty, you know, it's pretty special, like it's a special thing. It's definitely not Zen and it's definitely not martial arts discipline. Right? It's short skirts and glitter and butts everywhere and it's just a, it's a whole nother world, right? So uh, I had to come to terms with that. It was something that was a little bit embarrassing to me that I left something, you know, like uh, the first time I went to Japan dancing, they asked if I wanted to visit a dojo and I said, no, 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 no. I was 27, 26. I said, no, no, it's okay, I don't want to visit the dojo because I was embarrassed that I had left this and uh, I felt a little ashamed of But I came to the realization that I, I, I started, when I became serious about dance, I became serious about dance as a continuation of, of what I had done in my life in martial arts and I now answer that question very differently. I, I, I have never stopped doing that. My exercises have changed to the exercises of dance, but everything else is, is the same that I've been doing since I was nine years old. Um, and that's the important stuff. It's not the, the form that it's 
taking specifically, but it's all the underlying stuff, the philosophies and the, the outlook that really is what drives it. And so um, I applied those things to the way I trained the dance uh, to formalize, because my goal was to formalize Afro-Latin dance as something that could be respected by the other established art forms as high art, which is something that had been missing and is still missing in the Afro-Latin dance world. If you say salsa or you say Latin dance to people of high art, they immediately dismiss you, you know? Dancers, you know, trained dancers that have been dancing and are in shows and compete with blood and guts to be in, in companies and stuff like that, they immediately, you say salsa and they're like, oh, that's not real dance. And people in salsa say, oh, I, we did a show with real dancers, you know, there's this, uh, there's not a lot of respect there because it's it uh, and and not that it uh, that we as Latinos have done anything to really warrant the respect. We we were the ones propagating the stereotypes, and I understood that very uh, very well. But I wanted to produce uh, dance theater and produce uh, a technical skill that could be comparable to established artifacts, and so. The only way that I knew to do that was the way that I trained martial arts. You know, if there's a skill that you want to achieve, there's an exercise or a group of exercises that you have to do for years to achieve that skill. That doesn't exist in, in the way they teach Latin dance now. It's to do this and do that and do this, and then you can either do it well or you can't. And if you see somebody doing it a certain way, you say, hey, maybe I'll do it like that with my hand flick this. But there's no real training involved. It's kind of monkey see, monkey do. And so I wanted to formalize the way it was trained so that I could elevate the skill level of the dancers so that the art world could see them and say, this is legitimate, this is serious, this is not stuff that anybody off the street can do, and it's sophisticated, uh, it's, uh, we can use it artistically, because art isn't just doing things well, it's, it's doing things well to make commentary on life. You know, Latin dance has always just shown Latin dance. Hey, this is Latin dance, and this is Latin dance, and this is what you can do in Latin dance, and this is Latin. They never use Latin dance to speak about the world as, as, a, as a language, to talk about things that we deal with in our lives. And that's where I think the line is drawn between art and folly, you know? And so uh, the stuff that I choreograph and the, the stuff that I do is is full of that sophistication so that the person who's looking for depth can see it. It's just that they're looking at it through the the glasses of Afro-Latin dance, you know? I, I kind of see the world through the glasses of Afro-Latin dance. Afro-Latin dance is my, my unique cultural disposition because I'm a Puerto Rican that was born in New York, estranged from where my culture comes from, but influenced by the the black culture and the black music and the and the, the grittiness and the the powerful influence that New York has on anything that makes its way there. And so that juxtaposing that is my life, you know. I listen to salsa music, but I was listening to early hip hop and, and, and rap music and soul music and uh, Motown. My mother was always playing Al Green, you know, she was uh, cleaning the house, and my father was listening to Fania and, and, and Hector Lavo and that stuff, so that was my experience. And this dance uh, is a reflection of that. And the way that I approached it, and the way that I see the world now, is all kind of through that, that lens. Yeah, that's my story. <laughs> Это были, были упомянуты такие музыкальные влияния, да, но у меня вопрос к Денису Аду. Вот, известно, что сейчас вопрос, который многих волнует, это вопрос взаимодействия музыки, музыкантов и танцоров. Все больше и больше танцоров под живую музыку, да, хорошо проводит время, и все больше музыкантов, которым нравится играть для танцев. Какое-то время этого не было, ну да, ну, по крайней мере, у нас. Да. И 
что нужно музыканту для того, чтобы э, вот именно в диалоге с танцором существовать? Ну, так, как starting point. Всем привет. Хороший вопрос. И на самом деле мне очень удобно тут сидеть и слушать ребят. И хотя я не, не очень в теме танцев, можно сказать, не разбираюсь, э, в какой обуви нужно танцевать и так далее, но что-то знаю про музыку. А, а, Фрэнки рассказывал про то, что он учился с Эдди Торресом. На самом деле многие музыканты очень сильно сотрудничают с танцорами. Они вдохновляются танцорами, и мы знаем легендарных танцоров, таких как Эдди Торрес. Я хотел бы начать с небольшой истории о том, как я с ним лично познакомился. Это было в Варшаве на Сальса фестивале. Мы играли в Дислокадос с Джимми Бошем. Да. И я в гостинице разыгрывался на трубе, как обычно это делаю. И кто-то постучал в дверь. Я играл упражнения, они, конечно, неприятные очень для окружающих. Вот. Я открыл дверь, и стоял мужчина. Я, естественно, я не знал, кто это. Он был похож... ...на человека из Индии. Он стоял очень сердитый, он стоял в такой майке, как у Фрэнки, и в трусах. И еще у него была вот эта штука, чтобы спать. Ну, это было где-то пять 6 часов вечера, не так поздно. Вот, он очень злой, он, он ничего не варил, он просто стоял и смотрел на него. Потом он что-то сказал, типа, эй, чувак, я тут пытаюсь поспать. Все такое, но... Для меня был это обычный человек, и обычно, когда мне нужно разыграться, я смотрю на него, типа, тебе нужно поспать, а мне нужно поиграть. После этого я уже увидел его на шоу, он был в невероятно красивом костюме, мне кажется, он всегда одевает просто невероятные костюмы, невероятные туфли, он выглядел, не знаю, как... Отец мамбо. И я даже не, не знал, что через время, когда я поеду в Нью-Йорк, у меня будет возможность и шанс поиграть вместе с ним с группой, которая называется Mambo Kings Orchestra. Вот, поэтому, в принципе, взаимодействие началось с танцорами, можно сказать, с этого момента. Если ближе к техническому моменту, то мне очень нравится, что делает Федя. На самом деле я изначально, можно сказать, джазовый музыкант больше, чем сальсовый. Но так произошло в Киеве, что приблизительно в 2008 году появился Илья Ереська со своей идеей, которая начиналась с Latin Jazz. Мы играли в Latin Jazz без вокала. И... Это было не очень интересно. Без бокала нет бокала. Yeah. Вот. Не, не очень интересно танцорам, поэтому они не приходили сначала, потому что была немного такая сложная музыка для восприятия. И это начало трансформироваться больше ближе к сальсе. Вот. И к нам начали приходить танцоры. И когда мы начали понимать больше, я начал понимать, что все-таки мы играем для них, и когда они приходят и танцуют, это абсолютно для, для музыкантов это абсолютно по-другому, когда кто-то просто сидит и слушает вас в филармонии, как вы играете, или кто-то реагирует на, на вашу музыку в то время, когда вы э, играете и понимаете смысл того, для чего вы вообще это делаете, в принципе. Поэтому это абсолютно две разные, два, два разных мира для, для меня, по крайней мере. И скажу честно, что некоторые 
танцевальные пары, особенно девушки, заставили меня выучить очень много музыки наизусть с царствой. Потому что смотреть, как они танцуют и играют, смотреть ноты невозможно, поэтому... За несколько лет я выучил больше ста песен с сальсовых мод просто. И с Дислокадос мы были на очень многих фестивалях, и где проходят мастер-классы, и, конечно, не всем музыкантам это интересно, но мне было интересно, потому что я еще немного фотографирую, поэтому я приходил и просто наблюдал. Мне очень было интересно, как кто подает, как кто преподает, и просто наблюдать за движениями, как люди учатся реагировать на музыку, как преподаватели рассказывают им, что делать, когда происходит в музыке тот или иной момент, там остановка, либо не остановка, учиться слышать музыку и реагировать на это. Вот. Поэтому, если бы я не был такой ленивый, я бы уже научился танцевать неплохо, мне кажется. И также я играю джазовую музыку и могу немного рассказать больше о взаимодействии джазовых музыкантов и танцоров. На примере у нас с Алиной, потому что до нее, можно сказать, я не очень видел, в принципе, как можно под джазовую музыку танцевать. И в один момент мы играли джемсейшены на открытом воздухе в Киеве, и мы играли чаще всего такой мейнстрим и бибоп, не очень связанную. Это связано со, сви со свингом, но это очень быстрый свинг, и до этого момента я не представлял, как под это можно танцевать. И под сценой в один момент я увидел Алину, как она танцует, и это очень органично выглядит. Я, я даже и представить не мог, что такое может произойти. Вот. И через время мы начали общаться, она приходила чаще. И я скажу то, что, в принципе, игра, когда ты видишь, как кто-то реагирует, она меняется, потому что э, обычные музыканты, они очень достаточно закрыты в своем мире, когда они играют, они думают о многих вещах, о которых вы даже не представляете, которые связаны с музыкой и не связаны с музыкой тоже. Но в основном, которые связаны с музыкой. Особенно джазовая музыка, она требует очень много вычислительных процессов в голове. Она очень, свя... она очень связана напрямую с математикой, как мне кажется. Вот поэтому многие музыканты э, забывают, можно сказать, о музыкальности и начинают просто заигрываться. И, как мне кажется, нет ничего связанного с музыкой в этом смысле. Вот. Поэтому, когда... Музыканты играют, они думают о каких-то своих вещах, и мало кто реагирует вообще на то, что происходит в зале. Ой, в зале да? Но когда появляется кто-нибудь под сценой с амплитудными движениями, его сложно не заметить. И тебе нужно что-то делать с этим, потому что ты не можешь просто... Да, но это, это интересно, и... Я бы сказал, что это в какой-то степени сложнее делать. То есть ты, думал, ты должен думать, помимо этих технических моментов, как играть ритм, мелодии, песни, которые ты играешь, гармонии, там вот эти все вычислительные истории, ты должен еще как-то взаимодействовать с танцором, потому что он уже, можно сказать, часть, да, часть вот этого музыкального процесса. Ты не можешь его игнорировать, это будет абсурд. То есть это так... Если музыканты, допустим, не уважают друг друга, и я буду что-то играть, и пианист или барабанщик ему будет не нравиться, и он будет играть в противовес мне. Никакой музыки не будет, это будет звучать ужасно. И второй момент, если я буду играть что-то неправильное, и он меня поддержит, этого никто из вас не ощутит. Он сделает так, что мои неправильные звуки станут правильными. Вот. Поэтому то же самое с танцорами. То есть Конечно, если не обращать на них внимания, когда они танцуют, и 
не, взаимодействовать, не взаимодействовать с ними, то будет полный абсурд. Но если это взаимодействие происходит, это выглядит потрясающе, как мне кажется. И в этом очень много смысла. Я для себя понимаю, зачем я играю, что я играю. Ну и все. Frankie, you definitely know the Har U percussion group. Yes. Sure. I was impressed that uh, I learned the story of this group, that this was actually uh, an educational project to somewhere in 1963 to move uh, kids from streets due to riots, etc. So, uh, and uh, that is visible or clearly shown in the music because it's very powerful, there is right in this music, apparently. So, uh, the question is, is there something uh, like this in um, modern New York or in modern Latin culture? Uh, are there still projects like this? Uh, yes, for those of you who, who don't know what he's uh, referring to, the, the, uh, the, I became very well known for a particular performance uh, to a song called Welcome to the Party by the Haru Percussion Group. And the Haru Percussion Group uh, stands for Harlem Youth Percussion Group. And they were kids. Uh, it was an album at the time when I discovered the song, the album was out of print. It wasn't really, uh, it wasn't a professional group that recorded this, it was a program, a youth program to uh, get kids off the street and teach them music and they took the best of those kids and they actually made a recording. It's funny because if you listen to the album you can hear, you can hear mistakes and that there's, you can tell that they're not super polished but the, but the music is all very, very soulful and there's a lot behind the music. There's a lot to uh, discern or to uh, take out from what you're listening to. There's a lot of passion there. Uh, and so uh, that was in the 60s, uh, somewhere around 1963, uh, that they recorded this album. I actually got the song on a compilation and then started to search for the album that it came from and I was able to find uh, people that were actually selling copies that they owned that uh, uh, were in good condition and then after I had performed it for many years, the album suddenly went back into print. And I think that had something to do with me, I hope. <laughs> but it's kind of strange, you know, all of a sudden the, the album's back in print, everybody's looking for it, you know, they, they, all, everybody was interested in this. Uh, yes, I think everywhere now that is a sociological, psychological, cultural norm at this point to give children alternatives to the streets in, in uh, lower income areas and, and impoverished areas where, where children's energy is not focused and they sit idle and they get bored and they get into trouble. Uh, there are tons of programs like that, I'm sure, all over the world. Uh, but uh, particularly, um, I have a student who is, uh, works in the, uh, in the Department of Education, and he teaches uh, dance, salsa, everywhere he teaches and everywhere he's, uh, and these are Chinese kids in schools in Chinatown, he's Taiwanese. And he's got all these Chinese kids dancing salsa and listening to salsa music, it's incredible. Young kids, and they, they're not at risk of being on the street, they're just dancing around. But, uh, and also he is connected to a music teacher, he studies percussion uh, from a very famous music teacher in New York uh, called Louis Bauza. He is one of the, uh, 
he, he is one of these guys that has been teaching music for a very long time. He's, he's on the, uh, uh, he's played with Johnny Colon and with uh, Larry Harlow on albums. There's recordings that we have. Mere Kumbe, that song by Johnny Colon, he's playing bongo on that song, on that album. And uh, many established musicians in New York have studied with him and many study with him uh, to this day, they attend his workshops and he continues to refine them. These are musicians that have recordings and, and uh, parts of bands and leaders of bands and they still come to, he went to Juilliard, he's an exceptional <laughs> music teacher. Uh, but also, Gianni Colon uh, started to teach. Uh, he's a uh, singer uh, and pianist and band leader uh, for many, many, many years. And he had a youth program for a long time in El Barrio in Spanish Harlem. And uh, he's taught many kids. Actually, Mark Anthony was Johnny Colon, one of Johnny Colon's music students when he was a child. So uh, there's a movie called um, We Like It Like That. I don't know if you guys got a chance to see that. It's the, we translated yeah. here. Yes, nice. The, the story of uh, Boogaloo. So yeah, they, they talk about that a little bit, uh, Johnny Colon, uh, his youth program. But uh, in not just in music, but in, in all the sports programs that are set up to keep kids. Uh, that Our thing, because it was the karate kid uh, time, I was in that era where everybody was like, karate kid, karate kid movie came out, and so everybody was rushing to learn karate. I was part of that wave, and it was kind of another way to get kids some discipline and get their energy out and get all that that uh, that hyperactivity to be focused on something positive. Uh, yeah, I think you can find anywhere uh, uh, programs like this for dance, music, and, and all types of art forms that are trying to give those kids somewhere to go, boys clubs and girls clubs and things like that. One small addition to the question. Yes. Ah. Yeah, we're not. <laughs> about, yeah, I'm restless. Uh, <laughs> about this welcome to the party. Uh, you are teaching and having your own parties back in New York. Do you ever uh, play this song on your parties? The, the album is actually very varied. Uh, they, they do a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, it's a, more like Latin funk, you know? It's not uh, straight Latin. There is stuff. There's some. There is a formal like uh, what you would call uh, guaracha type and descarga type formatted songs. But there's some like soul music on that, and it's a lot of funky stuff. It's that is right smack in the Bulu era, where where that fusion of of the the black cultural uh, influence and their music and and that. Uh, movement is getting uh, fused with uh, the, the Latin and the Puerto Ricans that were in New York. So, so the album shows that you know that there's a lot of that combination. So I definitely don't ever play songs that I have performed to. I never play them socially, and a lot of times they're inadequate songs for social dancing because I choose performance music uh, with very specific parameters in mind as to how I choose the music. And one of those things is the way that the song is formatted. Uh, the composition of the song should uh, provide a framework for me to operate within in terms of um, composing the movement of my piece. In, in other words, there's a structure to the song that lends itself to having a a comprehensive uh, storyline, so to speak, physically inherent in the music. So I like songs with structure. What is going on here? It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> People are sliding around on the couches and having a game of Twister. Here. Um, so, La Palomilla, I never play that. If it comes on and somebody asks me to dance, I say, I can't dance this because I, I choreographed it, I performed to it, it's kind of off limits for me, so I don't do that. And some of the other music that's on there is, is on the funk side, 
and I'm and it it you know it's very easy to throw salsa dancers off. You know, I play enough Mozambique and Boogaloo and Boleros to make everybody angry. <laughs> so <laughs> the last thing I want to do is start throwing in uh, Latin funk and things that are even further away from their one, two, three, five, six, seven uh, comfort blankets. You know. So I don't, I don't play that album. That album is one of those personal things to me that's like, uh, if I play it, it's almost like somebody looking through my underwear drawer. You know, like it's, it's, it's mine and it's, there's a lot of personal attachment to it and it's not something that I, uh, that uh, I feel comfortable necessarily uh, putting out there for people to kind of uh, disrespect and not really pay attention to. And so I, 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 ha I have a few, uh, albums like that that are kind of personal to me and I, and I don't want to ruin them for me by by watching people uh, you know pee on them yeah. urinate everybody good yeah <laughs> thank you so any more questions <laughs> Since we started to talk about music and uh, Dennis mentioned um, and like technical aspects and aspects of interaction between dancers and uh, musicians, I would like to ask um, all of you, actually, uh, how you deal with musicality and um, how you deal with the music that you are dancing to. Like Frankie said something about uh, that only in classes. Yeah, so that we are not separated from music, we are music yeah so it's interesting for me because you're so um, you belong to one culture I think but you're different you have your own traditions your own styles uh, Josette is a tap dancer so she basically creates music yeah. and it's interesting to know how you <coughs> how you deal with that let's so start <laughs> I'll be brief I'll pass the torch uh, I, I've, I've, uh, I, in my teaching, and it's it's part of the way that I uh, came to understand my uh, my discipline. I, I teach in stages. I first teach people to learn to follow music. That's the first thing. That's the first stage. Is how how are they going to follow music? How music is kind of setting up the. The, uh, the established framework, and then how are you gonna now fit within that established framework? I actually assigned them uh, meditative exercises, listening exercises. At, at, uh, in the studio, we don't, um, I don't allow anyone to speak once they are on the wood when there's music playing. Uh, so you can socialize outside and you can speak outside, but once you come into the studio, you're not allowed to speak if there's music on. In the advanced classes, you're not allowed to speak at all whether the music is on or not once you come into the wood because verbalization is not a luxury that we have in dance. And so immediately I can't allow your brain to have that option to express yourself verbally anymore because it's, it's not the way I want you to think about it. The other thing is that that's our time for listening practice. It's your time to respect the music and to f refine your ear as to how this music is put together and how you're going to connect to it. The ear has to be developed. It's a very important part of your development. We don't know how to listen. We don't know how to be quiet and listen. It's not a given that you are hearing what's happening in music. Music is extremely complex. Uh, Latin music is polyrhythmical. Every instrument is built on the pattern of the next instrument and built on it, and they all have points of congruence where they connect to each other, and they're layered and layered and layered. And what you're getting is an overall sense of a large rhythm, but there are many rhythms that are laid on top of each other that are giving you that feeling. And so, getting your ear tuned in to understand what is the normal operating procedure for the bongo and what is the normal operating procedure for the bass and what does the piano sound like 
separate from the bass or the vibes and getting your ear to be able to find that stuff. So I give them exercises while we are quiet before class so that they can refine their ear and refine their connection to music. So I have them follow an instrument all the way through the song, follow the piano all the way through the song, don't lose the piano, stay with it from the beginning of the song to the end of the song. You know, if the song drops out, piano drops out, when it drop, comes back in, you have to know exactly where it comes back in. You have to focus, 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 and try to keep your uh, connection to that piano. Do the same thing with the conga, do the same thing with the bass, do the same thing with the bongo. Uh, and it teaches people how to find those instruments, what they sound like, how they differ. It starts to get them familiar with the patterns and the variations that are specific to those instruments. And it also is meditation and concentration exercise because if you can't concentrate for four minutes, if you can't focus completely for four minutes, you're, you, you have no chance to become part of that music. So uh, that's how we start, uh, is following. Then I start to teach them to add music to what they're listening to so that they start to bring music and add it to the song. So there's the musicians, they're jamming, and you are a musician, you are another musician who is now joining the band to jam with the band. I don't see myself as, as, a, as a dancer, as an entity outside of the band. I'm another musician. My discipline, my music is in a slightly different dimension, but you know, I'm a musician. And so I'm jamming with the band. So I'm not following them literally anymore. I'm now adding my music on top of it, which means that now I'm filling space and I'm bringing my, right? If I'm a violinist, I'm going to jam a certain way with the band. I'm not gonna follow them necessarily. We're all connected and we're following each other, but I'm adding music. I'm not playing the violin to the piano and following the piano exactly. The violin is doing its thing that coordinates with the other instruments. Um, and then ultimately, we start to, uh, I get them to work on listening to music from here, from the tandem, from the hara, from their belly, instead of listening to it from here, so that they can start to allow the music to actually give them permission to move. And all the things that you have practiced to this point, in terms of creating music to add to the band, starts to now come to fruition in terms of that being how you are operating. So I don't think of physical things happening. I'm creating <coughs> rhythms in my head. And does it, whatever song is going on, that's dictating how I'm flowing. I'm jamming with them. But I'm not thinking of physical movements. I'm not thinking of I'm going to do a roll here, and I'm going to do Suzy Q here. And that's not how I'm thinking. I have these, this music going in my head. And that, those things are giving me permission to respond. And so you're not uh, reacting to music, you are manifesting music, right? You, you're not, uh, I don't want to be separate from music. I don't want music to be there and dance to be here or music to be there and me to be here. I don't want those lines of delineation. I don't want uh, the picture of the dog, I want the dog. This is the picture of the dog is not the dog. It's a picture of the dog. If you're expressing music, then you are, that's an, uh, 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 a level of separation from the thing. And I don't want any levels of separation. I don't want to express, I want to manifest. I want to bring into existence the music. I want to show you physically what is being shown to you and manifested audibly. And, and that's the perspective that I take in terms of, of music and musicality. There's only music, there's only dance. That happens to be audible dance, and I happen to be doing physical music. There is no separation. We, we are defining them by the dimension they're in, but they're, they're, it's one thing. We're just, as human beings, we have to take a stance on how we describe it so that we can speak to other human beings. But at the end of the day, there's is really not a difference. Well, <laughs> as it's happening,
question is there a lot of what you're saying from me translates to me um, what Tavis is inspired to do. I don't I can't say that it's what I do, but it's what I aspire. Um, initially when you begin you have to learn what the steps are. So you learn selects, you learn shuffles, you learn heels, you learn the vocabulary that you need to use. Yeah? And then after that you learn how to place that vocabulary in the time frame of bars. So the bar, I think of it as a trim. It doesn't stop. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. In a traditional four, 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 four time frame. Yeah, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So the idea is that you learn the vocabulary that you learn has to fit and make sense in the structure or else it's not valid. So this is the second phase. First you learn the vocabulary, then you learn how to place this vocabulary in the structure, in, uh, in time. And then from there, you learn how to express, or I don't want to use this word anymore because <laughs> <laughs> now I've changed my <laughs> You learn how to let out <laughs> uh, your own understanding of this vocabulary, your own uh, ideas with this vocabulary. Yeah, so you learn from your teacher, you learn from, but at some point you have to now say what it is that you placed here to say, yeah? And so um, uh, there are many ways to train <coughs> to, to get to the point where you can do this on a high level. And the one major way that my brother and I we love to do is we listen to jazz music and pick out, uh, you know, specifically what Frankie was saying. We might follow just the sax solo and learn it note for note. We might fo follow what the bass uh, is doing and follow that and play exactly what he's playing as a practice. We might follow the piano or we just learn the melody. So there's no one way to practice or train, but once you def once you find what it is for you, that works for you, to help you train your skills, then from there, once you're soloing, you use bits and pieces of these exercises in real time. And the more you do it, is the, I don't wanna say better, but the more comfortable you feel doing it. And uh, just trying to be honest in the moment and allowing because every time you improvise, it's, it's, it's a very vulnerable <coughs> moment, yeah? Because you're taking um, your emotions from that day, because every day you feel different, and you have experiences, the conversations that you had that day, what happened, you know, to your mom. It affects your improvisation that day. So you have to be very honest and um, use this and not try and fight it go with preconceived notions like, okay, I need to do this trick because this will wow the audience. No, no, no. You need to surrender and allow the ideas to come with how you do it. So. <laughs> Being honest, that's the main thing. Being honest to that day, that moment. Even when you're practicing, what you did yesterday in practice isn't necessarily what you need to do today in practice. It isn't necessarily what you need to do tomorrow. So I would say just find a series of exercises that work for you, and then depending on how you feel, depending on what the circumstances are, and your time frame, one day you might have two hours of practice, one day you might have 10 minutes. So how do you focus that 10 minutes to get the same results that you would in a two hour practice? So these are the things that I uh, try to think about when I'm working on my conversation. Um, yeah, just overall trying to become a better musician because tap dance is 100% dance and 100% music. You are not standing in one spot, just making music, and you're not just moving around, your, you know, it's a combination of both. So you have to work on both skills. How do you embody what you're hearing? And how do you also add your own ideas to what you're hearing as well? You can play along, or you can change it up, or you can, you know, that it's an, it's, an, it's an infinite amount of possibilities that you can do. And so it's just being smart about what do you choose in that moment. Yeah.
y con ritmos, por ejemplo, y hay, mm, por ejemplo, espacio para improvisación ahí, o no, o como, como lo ves como artista. Y has expresado a todos que en África, por ejemplo, en отличие от джаза, en отличие от тепа, где очень много есть пространство для импровизации, в Африке культура, например, шагов и музыкальных ритмов следует очень строгой традиции. И мой вопрос был, состоял в том, есть ли там место для импровизации, как Анелис, как художник, как артист, то, что называется, да, видит и как интерпретирует. Соня, как мы тебе говорим, Yo estaría violando también los códigos que tienen que 
Четыре слова. Анелис преподает в основном афрокубинские танцы, которые имеют достаточно четкие правила. Это закрытые танцы, есть определенные ритмы, есть определенные слова, которые поют певцы, и есть определенные движения. Есть набор движений, среди которых можно импровизировать, но ничего снаружи невозможно добавить. И, и часто танцы — это такое общение между перкуссионистом, между певцом и танцором. И танцор часто выбирает, импровизирует в зависимости от того, что играется и что поется. И, например, на примере того, что мы делали сегодня, вчера на занятиях Анелис, еще раз тоже повторюсь, это э, была такая импровизация на основе э, ритмов афрокубинских, на основе пластики афрокубинской техники, но это были не те танцы, которые вот закрыты, которые говорят. Поэтому ничего мы о религии не говорили, мы в основном делали... Ну вот, например, да, когда поется что-то там во время танца, что вот она вышла из дома, она причесалась или там она пошла, вернулась домой, и вот уже танцор иллюстрирует то, что, то, что поет в этот момент певец. И что-то другое, ну как, если поется там, допустим, она причесывается, она будет изображать какой-нибудь там, то, что она там пошла в магазин или еще куда-то или купается. Поэтому там очень сложно импровизировать. Среди, э, среди вот определенного набора движений можно импровизировать, но ничего нельзя брать снаружи. Иногда бывают какие-то современные танцоры, которые пытаются импровизировать, что-то развивать, но очень часто э, старожилы, ветераны танцев, с ними смотрят и пальчиком вот так вот грозят, что это не то, нельзя так делать, потому что э, они нарушают правила, нарушают коды определенные, которые существуют в этих танцах. То есть меняется, может поменяться ритм, но внутри той же системы. И, соответственно, как бы танец тоже меняется в соответствии с ритмом, но внутри системы, не выходя из системы. Можно я спрошу, что такое, что Арина или Соня приведут для наших гостей? Мне кажется, чтобы импровизировать, нужно знать корни. Если ты не знаешь корней, ты не знаешь, от чего отталкиваться или как. Siempre se necesita tener como un, un patrón y una serie de, de movimientos. ¿no? Es como si... si es un... Da, está bien. Sí. Improvisation, actually, I think so we came to a point where we can talk about that. For example, in Afro, they have really close bass. Um, what about jazz? Like Feder said that if we don't have roots, if we don't have system, we can't improvise. It. Otherwise, it will be randomness. Yeah. So, what do you think about that? Should we have roots? Because here, evolution is all we can. We kind of insist that all this African American culture comes from Afro. And Afro has really close system, and how how can we trace yeah, those roots and about improvisation? Like, should we know the roots? <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> see somebody and I see it in, in dancers that are still learning you see them uh, 
doing their thing and improvising, and when I see it, I don't necessarily see, I don't see the connection. It's it's just absolute randomness. There is always, uh, even in musical solos, you hear musical solos. Uh, that is the that's the skill. That's the the beauty, right? Beethoven used to uh, when he liked somebody a lot, and he would bring them into private quarters and he would play for them, but he wouldn't play for anybody else. Beethoven had a thing about people, you know, play for us and him feeling like a clown and him entertaining. He he hated that, right? So, and uh, that's why I connect with this guy. <laughs> But, um, so he wouldn't play for anybody, no. I mean, he would write his symphonies, but he was a master player. Like, he was a, a super virtuoso. He battled every virtuoso of his time, and he, he beat them all. Uh, but he, that wasn't his thing. Like, he didn't want to show that off. He wanted to compose and make his, his uh, compositions. But he would bring them into a room, and he would ask them to give him a theme. And so they would give him the theme. La -di -da -da -di -da -da -di -da. And he would take that and he would play for them for two hours off that theme. If he would just play randomness, he would never have to ask them for the theme. He was asking them for the theme because his brilliance was shown in his ability to continue to carry that theme throughout the entire course of his playing. Uh, Jimi Hendrix's song, uh, Machine Gun, right? Uh, John Coltrane's uh, Afro Blue. Uh, there's a theme there. There's a, in, right? in jazz you have this theme. There's a theme that is the song, and then they go off and they do their thing, but the theme of the song is something that stays present even when they're deviating. That connection is always there. There's always a base that brings us back to what we're doing thematically. And that's important because as those themes change in feeling, Jimi Hendrix's machine gun is about war. It's about the Vietnam War. And he it's basically a solo. He's playing a solo the whole time. But he does not deviate. And that song is very uh, is very special. Every time I'm talking, something falls down. <laughs> I think I have powers. <laughs> um, that song is very, very special because it's not only the musical theme that he carries, but he carries an emotional weight throughout that song that is absolutely incredible because he's not just showing off what he can do on the guitar, he's showing off what he can do on the guitar in that world specifically. And when he plays another song, He's operating in a different world now, and everything that he's showing you is what he can do now with that world. It's not just what he can do in dead space. And so that becomes an important thing for us, the basic step, which is attached to the tumbao and the conga, that that is underlying all of my improvisation. I call it living on the bottom, and coming up every once in a while to touch the top, right? I live on the bottom, boom, and every once in a while I'll come up to hit the king, or I'll come up to touch that, but I'm always living down here, taking them away from the cultural bedrock that is really the important thing. don't know, um, I don't want to say where the roots are or where they came from, but if you don't have a foundation, how can you make a variation? It's, it's not a variation, you're just creating your own thing. And so that's kind of my stance on anything when I learn. If you don't know uh, or, or try to ascertain some sense of the ground level of the people who started whatever it is that you're studying, 
you don't start there and learn what that was, then you can't really change it. <laughs> so what you decide is not necessarily a variation of that, it's just you're creating your own path. So you can't call it a variation of this because you, you didn't learn this in the beginning. So how can you change something that you never really learned it from the start? And so that was my stance. My brother and I really um, studied the legends that at least we could get footage from or the legends that were alive when we were younger. We took classes from them. And they learned from the legends before them and before them. And you know, originally, a lot of the steps, like today we did the Takian. Didn't we recognize just the shoulder part from Annalise's? It's still, it's still there. It's from African humans. It's still being passed down in different ways, bits and pieces. And so this is what Frankie's saying, is that that theme is still carrying through. And um, the more we're aware of this, and the more we really try to make sure that our foundation and that our base comes from this place, I think the better we'll be as dancers, the better understanding we'll have, and, and the, we'll have a, a more clear view of where we want to progress to. If you have this foundation, then the future is clear, if that makes sense. And so. I overtook, really. I was just that actually you were the first uh, teacher on the Evolution Solo Weekend who took another teacher's class. Thank you so much for that. Joseph took after class. And she too. And she too. In the beginning, where we created, where we were creating the concept of Evolution Solo Weekend. We dreamed about the teachers also taking classes of another teachers, like so to create this cultural exchange between. Uh, and Josette was in four years, Josette was the first one to fulfill this dream. So, and she did, she really tried hard. And other students, when they saw her, they were like, oh, this person who's really a master, also fighting that also hard for the step as me. So, uh, we really saw people who. Okay. <laughs> 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 really helped. How did you like it? Did you did you feel like uh, something special? <laughs> I try my hardest to always um, throw myself into situations, and I took Afro-Cuban maybe eleven years ago in college. So it's a it's there, but I haven't done it since then. It took maybe one of it and so I just wanted to connect and it was incredible she's a genius Frankie is a genius uh, you have amazing people here like amazing is even the word to describe you have geniuses here who are giving you their knowledge and their expertise and I would just you know be very mindful of that that you're really fortunate <laughs> and very, very lucky to be able to take from these two people. And my arms and shoulders and stomach <laughs> were sore <laughs> for maybe a week. <laughs> but I loved it, and it was incredible. And I will be practicing. <laughs> Siempre que puedo, si me gusta vender, mirar, el año pasado, hacer frente, 
Она здесь о своих впечатлениях рассказывает. Пришла на класс, на ее говорит, такое ощущение было, как будто бы она вот когда-то жила этой жизнью, потом умерла и проснулась, заново возродилась, потому что она на самом деле была очень воодушевленная, оживленная на занятии Хуанелис. И она ли сама тоже очень любит, если есть у нее возможность, потому что не всегда бывает посещать занятия других преподавателей, учиться новым, новым вещам, новым направлениям, какие-то интересные мысли послушать. Ну, в общем, это очень важно. Кстати, она вот Ребят, многие спрашивали по поводу того, нужно ли чего-то учиться или нужно чему-то учиться. И do you remember that question of the people from Mambalov from Moscow? They I was told they that impression that Yeah. Yes. Yes. So in Moscow, I was uh, I was in Moscow in April, May, June. April, June, June. Jesus. Yes, it was just June. It was June. Sorry. I don't know what tomorrow is. Tomorrow's my birthday. That's the only reason I know what day it is, because otherwise I don't know. If After I stopped putting it on my school paper, I, st I don't know what day of the week, I don't know what's going on. But, um, so yes, in Moscow, I was, you know, I was giving my philosophical discussions and I was talking about um, studying something in the, and studying something to its depth and studying profoundness. And that there is a difference between the way dance, the, in dance culture and in martial arts culture and the way we uh, view uh, selecting a teacher and what that means. Uh, and I was discussing the importance of the uh, the philosophy of 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 choosing a teacher and that teacher accepting you, uh, and that is a very Eastern concept. Dance culture is different because dance culture, uh, the way it exists uh, at the high levels, is very much uh, towards finding work, right? And so dancers, nowadays dancers have to train everything. They have to do with hip hop, they have to do uh, jazz, they have to do a little tap, they have to, so when an audition comes up, they're ready to roll. If they require them to do a little hip hop, they're ready to go because they, they're invested in these things. But the hip hop that they do, when compared to a person who's been doing hip hop solely from their childhood, is going to be very different. Uh, there was a movie recently called Black Swan, not recently, but Black Swan, right? The, the movie. There was a controversy with that movie because they put out in the press that Natalie Portman had spent eight months training in ballet for this movie. And she did. But she wasn't doing the ballet in the movie. There was a body double that came in to do the ballet. And that girl was a trained ballerina since she was four years old. And that girl was very offended at the way they were portraying the fact that, wow, I can't believe Natalie Portman flips. Like she dedicated herself to learn ballet to do this thing. You don't learn ballet in eight months. What are you talking about, right? It is offensive to the people who have done, dedicated themselves and submitted to a discipline under a teacher who is famed and recognized and well-known for developing people and passing this on in a lineage. That's what happens in the East. In, in martial arts, you, you take your time choosing a teacher. And that means you take classes. You get introduced to them, you find out what they, you hear from them, you must go find this teacher, this is the teacher for you. You go, you find your teacher. When you find your teacher, you have to be accepted by that teacher. And it is a Zen tradition for that teacher to leave you at the door for three days, right? That's a, 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 in the monasteries when the monks, when people would come to study at the temple with a specific teacher, they would not open the doors for three days. You had to stay there for three days. Now it's still, it still continues in, the, in Japan. 
they are groomed as young men, and they're told that when you enter a temple, you're going to have to spend five days in the entrance, and you stay there prostrated for five days. And the monk comes every day, a few times a day, and tells you, go away, we're not accepting any students. For five days they do this. And he brings you rice, and you're there prostrating for five days. They bring you rice every once in a while, you eat the rice, you stay there prostrating, it comes out the next day, go away, we're not taking any students. Gives you the rice, goes away, five days. Finally he comes in and goes, okay, come on, come in, right? That is choosing a teacher, right? Do you know what you are asking? Do you really understand what you're asking of me? Do you, do you understand it? Are you ready to accept what it is that you're truly asking of a teacher? Culture now is very different. Now it's, a, it's approached as though we are providing a service to you. And the student dictates, I'm paying you money so you have to. And you must, and wait a minute, but, and the consumer is now treating the teacher like they're Starbucks, you know, they're providing, I'm providing, you provide, I pay for this, so, you know, uh, the student tells the teacher, well, I don't learn this way, this is how I learn, you don't do that in a monastery, you don't do that with a martial arts instructor, you do what they tell you to do, no questions, shut up, right? The karate kid, the first thing he tells him, no questions, no questions, do what I tell you to do, Wash the floor, paint the fence, you know, wax the car, wax on, wax off. He doesn't tell him why, he doesn't explain anything. The kid is like, okay, I'll wax the room, wax the floor. After a while, he gets frustrated and he says, you got me doing all the housework, I'm sanding the floor, I'm cleaning the fence, I'm doing it. I don't understand, I'm supposed to be learning how to fight, right? And the teacher, ha, da, 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 da. show me sand the floor. <laughs> Show me, show me paint the fence. <laughs> he shows him what he's been learning. And then he says, come back tomorrow to train starting early. And the kid is left, his mind is blown. He, he didn't realize that that's what was happening to him. You don't tell the teacher how to teach you. You don't go in to study with somebody with preconceived ideas about what they're supposed to give you. You have to you are the one that has to change. You're the one that has to understand. The teacher is there and understands already. The teacher has no, nothing to benefit by accepting a student that doesn't really understand what they want. And so it's a very different culture, right? We, we, you're dealing with the profoundness of something, not the acquisition of many, many things at a more shallow level. You're your concern is to have this person actually give you something in life that you're looking for, that you feel they have and have the ability to impart on you. And so there's a great respect there in someone who is submitting themselves to a teacher. There's a great respect for the teacher, for the person, that someone has the, the gumption, the cojones, to submit to this because it's not an easy thing to do. It's a different way of seeing things culturally. They call it entering a teacher's gate. You know, When you take a class with somebody, you enter their gate. You enter the gate, you enter the door, you get an introduction. That was, right, Josette entered Annalise's gate. She has not seen the house yet. She has not gone into the backyard. She hasn't gone into the temple. She is. She's just gone into the gate. And in dance culture, you go into many gates, but there is all this stuff there left to be understood. And that stuff will not be understood if you continue just to go into the gate. Whether you want to understand that or not is up to you. That may not be your concern, but there is still stuff back there whether you are concerned with it or not. And in order to understand that stuff, you have to submit and you have to go further in to the complex, into the temple, into the house, into the backyard to understand that stuff. And when you get over there, you're going to find the same thing that's in the backyard of this 
temple and the same thing that's in the backyard of that temple. It's the same thing. All the temples are leading to the same backyard. But we may not ever get there if we continuously go into the gates of different temples. There has to be a submission at some point to that specific temple so that you can find what's back there. And that's what I was referring to. It's a different culture and it's a decision that everybody makes about what it is they are seeking and what they're going to have to do to find it. So I hope that clarifies that because I, I'm, I'm never telling anybody what to do. I never tell anyone what to do. A good teacher will never tell you what to do. That's a cult, right? Do you, you know what cult, what cult is, right? Yeah? That's a cult. When the, when the guru tells you what to do, it's a cult, right? A teacher will never tell you what to do. They will point and they will guide you and they'll smack you in the right direction, but you ultimately have to make the decision and you have to uh, do it yourself. And so I'm never telling somebody, you must be serious. You have to be serious because you must be spiritual about dance. I never tell anyone that. I am s my function in this world is to present that possibility because the other dancers are doing their jobs very well in showing you different possibilities. And so I, I have to be a voice for this other possibility. That's all I'm showing you, is I'm showing you the moon is here, and if you ever want to get to the moon, you have to s surrender in a certain way to get there. If you don't want the moon, then you go on your way, you do what you want to do, yeah? I'm never, ever, ever telling you you must. If you choose to study with me, if you make the decision, and I accept you, when you are training with me, then you must. You must put your foot here, you must paint the fence, you must sand the floor because you gave me authority, and you submitted, and you chose me as your teacher, and now I'm going to teach you. Whether you like it or not, I'm gonna do what's best for you, not what you want. That's, that's, that's my uh, message and my function. Yeah? Make sense? Thank you. <laughs> Anonymous letter from from the audience. Uh, they say that uh, there are no festivals, there are no events like that in Europe, and it's hard to find them. Yes, it's me. Hello. Okay. And uh, I'll be loud enough. Yes. And there are there are no festivals like that, and it's hard to find them. And many my yes, like this year, like this year. Yes. And many minds were blown during these two days. And my question is basically to Alina. It's like uh, lots of people said thank you to all the guys who came here and to Alina personally and Feather who organized that event. <coughs> and some questions that I heard was like, what, what was the drive? What made you? To, to make this happen. And uh, yeah, what about 50 years from now? Thank you. Jenny, I'm here just to translate for the guys if somebody's speaking in Russian, but <laughs> uh, Well, the idea came back in 2012 um, when we, me and Fedor, we decided to amplify and uh, develop the concept that Castle Latina had. Um, mixing, not mixing, but um, showing the possibility of many dancing cultures that actually have many things in common and that can coexist within one room, within one home. Casa, that's why it's called Casa, you know, because it became home for many people who come here. Uh, so we decided to make something special to invite guests who personally inspire us. So basically to show students that they are teachers of our of their teachers, yeah. What we are inspired by. And we invited a guy, Joyce from France. Uh, in 2012 um, he and now he has really special style in jazz dancing. 
he has a background in street dance and in hip hop, and the way he moved was something incredible. And we decided to organize his workshop, inviting only him because we didn't have some financial possibilities yet. But we wanted to make something special. I think it's all enthusiasm that drives us. <laughs> I call it tragic humanism. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we invited him and it went really well. It was also on Castle Latina Thursday. Uh, and in two years we decided to make a festival, like a small festival weekend. But I think that it's going to become like a festival <laughs> in terms of level of teachers that we have here. And we invited Mr. Chester Whitmore, who is a legend. Uh, Joyce again and Annelies for Upper Roots to trace this evolution because that was better. He's doing a really great job. I want to thank him so much. What he's doing here. Uh, you know, he raised many generations already of salsa and dancers who had co opened many of their studios here in St. Petersburg. So I think it's definitely a sign of wisdom. Where is he? Over there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm drunk still. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is also part of your wisdom. This is the part that you choose. And yeah, these people came and uh, we thought that they were the best examples uh, to show this evolution from Afro through uh, tap dance to jazz. Yeah. And then when years went on, we have fourth evolution solo again back in 2000. 14, it became, it had its name, Evolution Solo again. And um, then we thought, what about Afro Latin edition? Was, and in 2015, we also had Chester Whitmore, it was Jazz edition. In 2016, we thought, what about Latin? Because we pressed on jazz more and Afro. And then we invited Frankie Martinez, and we are so honored that uh, he loved our concept and said yes to us. And I will come. <laughs> yeah, and. Because when we thought of Frankie, because we are fans of him since long time, well, Fedor is longer because he's older than me. And actually, I thought that if we pro like spread the idea of um, kind of making, a, not creating a language, but using a tradition, uh, and how can we use it? What future it, it has? Because, you know, when you dance swing, for example, you kind of make it sort of reconstruction. You know, like Baroque dance. You dance only like that, you watch videos, you dance only like that, and then you make kind of reconstruction, and no future for it. It's like concert there, you know? Yeah, and we thought, like, what, what future it should have if you are driven by tradition, if you really know what that masters, that, like Josette says, they put the bar really high. And you're not allowed to go like lower if you want to, to spread this knowledge over the world. Yes, and um, what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we thought of Frankie because Frankie is the best example, in my opinion, in my modest opinion, how you could use. Um, not used, but come from tradition of Afro-Latin dance in its at its widest. Because on last meeting in 2016, we were talking about Hala Hala that everybody was googling after. You know, <laughs> a lot of things changed after. <laughs> yeah, and about that uh, salsa is a kind of umbrella that embraces many styles and um, Lena Bomba and so on, and funk also and also jazz ethos. And we were discussing it in Torres here that he had so many. When you watch him make crosses and arms, looks like really jazzy, classy. Yeah, and um, I thought that Frank is the best example of how to push the tradition into future. And I thought that what we're doing with jazz, he's doing Latin. So we are colleagues, <laughs> you know, in these terms. Yeah, and we are really happy. And this year we wanted to kind of combine two worlds of jazz and Latin because he has many, many connections. I'm sure Dennis will agree on uh, connections. <laughs> Samba your Balboa. Samba your Balboa. Rumba your blues and Latin your Lindy. Uh, 
that uh, even jazz music, yeah, if when, when, for example, you play the tune, you can play swing, then you come into some Latin rhythms and the cascades, but it's all, all jazz. And so thus we came up to the idea of this festival, and I think it goes stronger every year in terms of audience, because more and more people who really need it come to it. You know, like Frankie says, you should really know what you want to get. I think we are trying to make a festival to spread educational mission, but we came up to a thought that it's actually a festival for mature dancers, you know, who tried this, tried that, and then they came up to a idea of interpretation of cultures, because like Frankie said, you don't have to mix. Yeah, you don't have to mix. We just want to show you that there is Afro, try it. There is tap dance, try it. You will educate your feet, you will educate your brain in terms of music. Try Frankie's stuff, try this everything, and you can dance only this, only that, or only Afro, only tap, and you can mix if you want. Yeah, but you can't be superficial in this. To mix these things, yeah, you should be profound. Sorry, I don't mean to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. All these things are mixes in the first place. <laughs> that all the things that we do aren't, they, they didn't come from outer space in a certain package that it was supposed to be. They're, they're all mixes. A person, people came up with this stuff. So they're all mixes. They're all, there's no, there is no such thing as something that must be and has to be. And it's, it, it, it's it, we're human beings. Somebody decided this. Understanding that is what I think. I, I just wanted to, uh, to, to comment about the, this to me is, one of the most intelligent concepts, uh, one of the most intelligent uh, uh, realizations that I, that I didn't even have until I came here of connectivity in, in disciplines, in musical disciplines and in dance disciplines because, because you have to kind of dig deep to understand how, how this stuff is threaded together, how, how it's all combined, and to bring them together into a single uh, arena, and to have people partake in them together at the same time, communities that wouldn't necessarily cross each other, and to actually demonstrate to uh, ourselves and to the, the audience, the connectivity of these things, like the historical connectivity of these things, it, 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 it requires an, an analysis that I think is extremely intelligent. And I just wanted to say that. I, I've never seen anything like this uh, in the world in terms of this line of connection. Somebody stumbled onto this <laughs> line of connection. Yeah. Extraordinary, extraordinary. I feel that this could exist everywhere in, in, in the, the, the different disciplines and how they connect and, and it, I think it is absolutely remarkable what's happening here. <laughs> yes, and thank you so much for coming because, you know, every year we came up to an idea because we were discussing uh, we were making kind of interview, you know, because we had this need to tell people on camera, like, look, we are not salsa festival. They people, you know what people were saying, like, um, well, Evolution Solo Weekend, well, there are many salsa festivals that are better than Evolution Solo Weekend. I say, definitely, but Evolution Solo Weekend is not a salsa festival. <laughs> it's not a swing festival. We decided to call it Festival of African American Dance. Yeah, because Latin is also Afri African Latin American. I would yes, say. And yeah, we got best teachers. And we ever. got the best <laughs> teachers in the world. My point of view, each of these teachers that we have um, represent their culture in the best way. They're native speakers of it. There, they are it. Frankie is mambo, is, is mambo, he doesn't dance mambo, he is mambo. Jolette is tap, is jazz, and Alice is afro. So we wanted native speakers who really would represent it in the best way for you, for people. Woo!
Questions? Okay. If like, do we have do we have some time still? Twelve more hours. Why? <laughs> okay. This is a question to all of us. <laughs> well, actually, I just have I have a but I have a serious question. Yeah, because we've been messing around. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. It's um, I'm just curious. It's serious to me. That's what I mean. Yeah. Or you. And I'm really eager to ask you because you're you're such knowledgeable people, you know, in this in this uh, this Afro Afro Latin American dancing, you know. Uh, I I I I really like that this is this is like a really natural culture, you know. It's like it comes from the really natural naturalness, you know. Uh, it's like grassroot culture. And it's been and it's been around for centuries, right? And it had developed had developed uh, up to the point when it started to be codified, you know. So at this point, like maybe it's more to you, the question to you, uh, Frankie. Like, um, what are you trying to do? Um, you're trying to apply your your own vision of how the mechanic band, the mechanic of the dance work. Uh, on the other, on the other hand, you're trying to elevate uh, to kind of uh, elevate it to a new level, like the level of classical music, classical like really high art, right? But my question is, like you have your like um, people who developed it like long ago, like maybe 19th century, 18th century, early 20th century, but how did they? Developed such a profoundness, such a such a quality of dance. You know, uh, did they did they use the same technique more or less like this the, the philosophy? You know, and why it started to 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 shift from the social dance like pure street dance up to the dance that is taught dance now at some, uh, 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 to a certain extent. So I just want to for you to reflect on this topic a little bit. Uh, one of the reasons that I think that this is so brilliant is because you actually have, um, you, you're, you have representations here of, of different stages of thought about this stuff. And, I, and, I, and it's, 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 uh, it's very interesting to me how each of us is, represents a different part of uh, a, a story, you know. We're talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years of us uh, dealing with this in terms of because they f they found musical instruments in in excavations, like the first musical instruments that they find in esca excavations are going back like a hundred thousand years. So, and we came out of Africa and we started to move and there were just, you know, separate migrations into Europe and a million years later there's another migration into Europe and, and there was a point where they start to actually distinguish modern men when they start to see musical instruments. And when we start to do that now, things start to change in terms of our uh, cognitive capacity and our capacity to transmit culture in in abstract ways, right? So we can start to speak about culture being not just how we find food and how we find a mate and how we raise our children, but in in the songs we sing and how we sing those songs and the the, the movements that our tribe engages in when we are uh, being festive or when we are morning but we're talking about a long time we're not talking about you know the the Benny More and forming a event you know we're talking about us uh, uh, 
Africa, uh, us as an animal, you know, us as a as an organism, uh, 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 our progression to uh, using music and dance and needing it and transmitting it from generation to generation to generation over time. My personal journey started out as an artistic endeavor to validate what was nightclub social street dance because that nightclub social street dance belonged in part to the culture in the Antilles that I'm connected to. I wanted it to be respected, you know? I wanted it to evolve and because I thought that everything was there, the potential was there for it to be, uh, and the time had been put into it for it to now turn into something that we could now uh, respect in terms of art. I don't feel that way anymore, but that, I don't feel the need to convince the world that the potential is here. I have moved on now from that being an artistic endeavor to validate the art form and to systematize the art form so that it can be transmitted in a more potent way and it can be matured in the individual to a degree that would warrant respect from other individuals who have dedicated their lives to specific established disciplines. Was that too long a sentence? Okay. I wanted respect for the thing, but the thing wasn't doing what it needed to do to have that respect from the community that I was looking for respect from. The stuff she does is very personal. It's very in here. It's not really designed for commenting on the world. And it's about their story and their thing. Um, and so, you know, turning it into a format that in using the parameters of established theater dance, you know, the way that sophisticated dance uses certain tools to, to, to be art. And I followed those things I did, I did, uh, you know, we created dance theater pieces, half hour pieces, you know. We used the gamut of Latin music, boleros, son montuno, guajira, guarachas, bomba plena, Mozambique, alajala, pachanga, all of it, bomba, I said it. All that stuff that's contained in that had to be part of it because I can't do two hour show of salsa, I can't do that, right? And so we became a theater company so that we can show them, look, we can do this in a sophisticated way that has layers that if the, a person comes in and just wants to see something cultural and artistic, they would pay money to sit down and see this. And it has, the music is infectious. And so even if you're not looking for the profoundity, for the profoundness, you're still loving the music. If you're somebody that needs to have some depth there, it's there for you also. Whereas the Salsa Congress, you kind of have to go there expecting, you know, just, you know, uh, an entertainment on a, on a certain level, like a dinner theater, right? It's not something that makes you think or that keeps you thinking about it later on in time. It's not commentary. I now view it as something spiritual. It's a personal development thing for me. But it, it's the culmination of all those attempts to find my journey in the dance and what I wanted from the world for the dance. The culmination of that came right back to me in a personal sense in terms of my evolution as an individual, spiritually, my, my, what, it, what the world means to me and how I'm living my life. And so I'm taking all those things without losing any of the, 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 the culture and any of the important stuff and using it to get myself more in touch with my humanness, which I can replace with my musicness and I can replace with my dance-ness, and helping others take that journey into becoming more in tune with their primitive self you know with their with and, and using sophisticated means to trick people into becoming connected to their primitive self their uh africa bambada would say their god self right africa bambada is a old hip-hop the godfather of hip-hop he described the way djs use a breakbeat in the record you find a part of the song 
that one little part of the song that is just, oh, when that part happens, you, oh, I wish that was longer, you know, I wish that little part of the song was more of the song. And the DJ would take that song and run it over, and run it over, and run it over, and run it over. And he said that that was the part of the song that allowed your God self to, to manifest, to come out, where you, that's where you lost your mind. That's why I use the word mambo and the conversation with the gods, your, your primal self, not what society told you you're supposed to be and you're supposed to buy and you're supposed to get married and you're supposed to do this and do that and have a job and this is what makes your life valuable and you're supposed to have a lot of money, not all of that stuff. All the natural stuff that was there before we made all those decisions about what we're supposed to be as people. That became the more important thing to me and I think that the I had to take the journey in that direction in order to, to come to that conclusion in a well-rounded sense that acknowledged and paid homage to the vehicle that I'm using for this type of self-realization. Uh, thank you very much, it's, uh, it's really important. It sounded like a manifesto. That was great. Uh, okay. Should we? Yeah. All right. Uh, actually, I got several questions, but in order to be brief, uh, my first one is uh, to everybody. Um, so you have been dancing, you have been playing music for such a long time. Have you felt? Have you ever felt bored and like sick and tired of what you have been doing? And is, uh, if, if I understood you correctly, Frankie, you are a Zen Buddhist, right? And is there any approach to deal with, bo with this boredom, with this tiredness? Absolutely. But it is a question to everybody, not only to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is what happens, I get put to start and then I never let anybody else finish. <laughs> yes, I have been bored. Yes, I have been sick and tired. Yes, I have been frustrated and disappointed and all of those things, depressed and fed up, all of those things. Uh, it's a marriage. Right? You, 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 you're not going to have a marriage and not be disappointed and not be frustrated and not be bored and not be, that's not reality, right? Yes, of course, but, but it's okay. It's okay, like, it's okay. That's how things are. I don't believe in, uh, I don't necessarily believe in, uh oh, what's happening? Gotta be better. So, um, uh, I don't necessarily uh, believe in motivation in the sense that we view it where you need to have your adrenaline up to do something and enjoy it. I don't believe in that. I believe that the reality of the thing you are doing presents itself when those chemicals are not no longer present. When you finally get past the opiate phase, right? The, the being high phase where it makes you high, when you finally level that out, the reality of the thing starts to show itself. And that's when you really start making the hard decisions about whether it's gonna remain part of your life and whether it is something that you want to continue to pursue for the rest of your life. I always tell people not to train hard, to train long. In other words, don't train hard right now for this moment. Train so that you will still be training at 80 years old. If you burn yourself out now as a kid and you start to form all your ideas now as a kid, <laughs> perfect, audible representation of what I was saying. Right? You're going to burn yourself out and whatever you learn, Whatever you think you learned at 25, practicing eight hours a day since you were nine years old, is nothing compared to what you're gonna understand at 80 years old after continuing to do it from that time. I call it peripheral understanding. 
it's not the thing that teaches you. It's life that starts to give you lessons that you then turn back onto the thing. One of the, uh, one of the descriptions of Michael Jackson as a child was Quincy Jones saying that he sung a song uh, that, who was it that sang the song? that an older singer sang. I, I, I feel so bad that I can't remember his name. Um, that an older singer sang, who was a famous singer, and he sang the song with as much feeling and as much soul as a child as this older man had sung, and the kid had not experienced the things he was singing about yet, right? And so the pain and the hurt and the, and the romance and the stuff that Smokey Robinson, so sorry, smoky shit. Uh, <laughs> so, how is this kid, you know, and, and, and that is kind of the thing, is that the, when you have those experiences, something is very different. When you have these understandings, these peripheral things that happen to you in life, they change the way you see what you're doing, and you cannot reproduce that. You can't make that happen in the moment. You have to live. You have to go through that, and you come back to find it. I don't practice because I love it and because it makes me feel good. I practice when it makes me feel good and I practice when it doesn't make me feel good because I just practice. The reason I call it practice is not because I'm practicing for perfection. I call it practice in the sense of a cultural practice. When I see you, I give you a kiss on the cheek and I give you a hug. Not because I want something, sometimes. <laughs> but because that's what we do it's a it's our practice it's a cultural practice if in in japan you take your shoes off before you go into a house you don't do it because it's going to make you better or not make you do it because that's what you do and w and you just do it for that you stop doing it because you think it's going to bring you something you stop doing it because you think it's going to make you feel good you fall in love with just doing it, no matter what the hell it brings you, and then you will have it for the rest of your life. If you do it because you're making that thing responsible for your happiness and for fantasies you have in your head about what you think life is supposed to be about, you're gonna be disappointed and you're gonna be frustrated and you're gonna leave it. It, it has to uh, be okay that it makes you sick sometimes. The same way it's okay that, because that's what life does. You get sick sometimes, you know? Life, you can't avoid getting sick, you're gonna get sick, right? You're gonna be frustrated, you're gonna be depressed, you're going to feel pain, you're going to lose family members. That's life, and it's just as valid as all the good feelings. Dance, you can't say dance is life if you're just doing it when your adrenaline is up because you see something that inspires you and then you start looking for inspiration and you can't do anything unless somebody's getting you amped to do it. That's not reality, that's being high all the time. You know, Reality is when you see something, right? Uh, in Zen they say emotion is uh, throwing a pebble in the, the pond. The reflection of the moon is no longer the true reflection of the moon anymore. You've thrown in something that's distorting what reality really is. And emotion does that, you know, and we're looking for emotion to keep us doing something. When we get bored, we want to do something else. That's not going to allow you to really benefit from the potential of these things. So, yeah, hell yeah, I get bored. Hell yeah, you know, but it's okay. I'm not afraid to be bored. I'm not afraid to be hurt. I'm not afraid to feel pain. It's okay. It's all okay. I'm going to keep doing my practice. when you've done any discipline or anything for a very long time, there are going to be waves, yeah, ups and downs. And I um, always had other things, like I started with piano first, so I did tap and piano, and then from um, that I switched to ballet, tap and ballet, and then from that I switched to, when I was 14, modern dance, and then 18, um, West African, and a little bit of Afro-Cuban, and then after college, I started doing Lindy Hop and tap dance. 
So I've always had something outside of tap dance that kind of um, gave me an outside perspective so I wasn't just consumed by tap dance. But tap dance has been, I've been married to it as what uh, Frankie was saying, that tap dance is um, not something that I do, it's been with me the entire time. And it's, there's a point where it changes from something that you're learning and studying to becoming a way of life. And so when I practice, it's, as Frankie's saying, it's not to uh, feel better or worse, it's when I'm having a bad day, I practice. When I'm happy, I practice. It's just, it's also a way for me to uh, sort out my emotions, just to clear my head. It just becomes this like friend and your therapy and you know, all of the, it's, it's weird. You start to have this relationship with the dance and you ride a journey together. You know, your life's journey um, kind of happens along with the dance. But what I've noticed specifically with myself is that when I'm when I plateau, when I'm at a point where I feel that I I at a wall and I can't break through, that's kind of a sign that I need to now not work harder, but push myself a little bit more. And then once I push through this wall, then I see more possibilities that I didn't know existed before. And then you're happy, you're quote unquote happy for a while because you're like, okay, I crossed this hurdle and you're in a new sphere, but then you're gonna plateau again and get bored again. And so I found that there's just series of like, as you get more information, as you, as you study longer, you, your understanding of the art form widens and broadens. And so these boring, bored moments are actually good moments for you. Yes. It's when you're starting to understand the sphere. You've learned everything in the sphere, but there's still more levels. So that just means you need to cross over from this level to the next. And then you're gonna get bored again, and then cross over from that level to the next. It's the, the example of the gate, and then the house, and then the backyard. It's the same thing. So being bored is actually a good thing, because that means now you have to search internally and figure out what you need
Анелис танцами с детства занимается, с раннего, и до 26 лет она жила на Кубе. И пока она жила там, говорит, что каждый день наслаждалась тем, чем она занимается, никогда ей не хотелось не бросать танцы, никогда не... скучно ей не было от этого. Но когда она переехала к нам... В общем, периодически такие мысли стали возникать. Ну, потому что нет окружения привычного семьи, нет рядом родственники все на Кубе остались, своей семьи нет пока. И э, иногда бывали такие мысли, иногда, например, после посещения каких-нибудь наших фестивалей, посмотрев, как, как танцуют у нас, возвращалась домой и думала, нет, все, хватит. Больше не могу. Но это, опять же, таки, ситуация, в принципе, нормальная, типичная. И э, сейчас... Сейчас я 34 года, и она до сих пор танцует, до сих пор занимается тем, чем... <свят> тем, что ей нравится. То есть мысли возникают, но э, до конца не доводит дело никогда. Я начал играть на трубе, когда мне было семь. И в девять я пришел домой и сказал маме, я заканчиваю играть. Мне кажется, вообще музыканты очень специфический народ, и они очень любят поедать себя изнутри, особенно в нашем постсоветском пространстве. Очень много музыкантов очень сильно самокритичных. И иногда вот самокритичность через чури выплескивается. И я знаю очень много музыкантов потрясающих, которые просто, можно сказать, сошли с ума на этой почве. Они просто, не то что они просто перестали играть, они продолжают играть, но то, что происходит с головой это просто ужас я даже не могу пере передать вам вот и вер вернусь к тебе в 14 лет э когда я продолжу играть на трубе когда нужно было поступать в музыкальное училище и выбирать делать выбор становиться профессиональным музыкантом либо нет моя мама сказала все стоп и я перестал играть, я не играл полгода на трубе. И в самый последний момент, перед вступительными экзаменами, не знаю, что это было, это было какое-то чудо, я просто взял инструмент и пошел на вступительный экзамен, не сказал об этом маме, она думала, что я иду учиться там в техникум, что такое. И меня взяли, я продолжил учиться, где-то полгода мама еще не знала, что я учусь в Казмачилище. Вот, и скажу, что после этого у меня были еще такие мысли завязать с музыкантом. Мне кажется, это очень часто бывает, потому что э, в моем случае я смотрел на некоторых людей, у которых очень легко получалось играть там какие-то произведения, и это меня убивало, потому что э, есть люди, которые, не знаю, более расположены к этому, более легче это достается, и есть другие люди, которые идут через труд, вот, и мне повезло меньше, я вот из второй категории, можно сказать. Вот поэтому, смотря на людей, которых все проще, я просто убивался об этим, и что я трачу гораздо больше времени, чтобы сказать то, что они делают за пять минут. Вот. Поэтому мысли бросить, посещать мне какое-то время, пока мне действительно не началась нравиться музыка, которой я играю, я понял, что все эти технические моменты — это лирика, как мы говорят. Вот. Музыка превыше всего, и ты стараешься играть и получать удовольствие от этого. И, конечно, хочется делать это супер круто, но все люди разные, поэтому получать удовольствие от того, что ты делаешь, то лучше всего в нашем мире, мне кажется. И получает за это деньги. Okay, yeah. Uh, I think.
think that uh, uh, we really have a, a number of geniuses here, you know, because the difference between just an outstanding thinker and a genius is that when you listen to a, just an outstanding thinker, you think, oh, that's that's interesting, oh, that's that's a new, really new information, I should check it out, and so on. But when you hear the genius, you think, oh, I always thought like that. But I could not put it in a, in the words. I couldn't formulate it. So I personally am very grateful to all of the guests, all of the great dancers and great thinkers that we have here, and personally to all of them. Huh? And musicians, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because last year we had one international participant, first one, from uh, Vienna, Austria. This year is three times more. <laughs> Two girls from Barcelona. <laughs> and Stephanie from Germany. Stephanie, where are you? Yeah, I'm in Germany. <laughs> and it was for visas to come to Russia, all these things. It means that they really wanted to come. And all of you. I'm sure there are those people who really wanted to take part. It was sold out in the first month, and I said, whoa, <laughs> what's happening, you know? It means that people really wanted to come, and uh, from day to day, from year to year, our audience is becoming more refined, you know? It means that people know what they want to get from it. And I want to thank all of you, all of you, and you also. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank uh, also, wait, wait a moment, uh, Dima Yegorov personally, who is our boss of he's Casa a, Latina. He's Where is he? He's already at home. Uh, he's at home. Dima, this applause is for you. Yeah. And also, I want to thank so much to live bands that we had this year. It was really hard to handle all the things, having two bands, no, oh, three bands in the event. And thanks to Denise Kupcov for helping organizing Friday party. Denise, where are you? <laughs> yeah. and thanks to Denise Kirillov, Dame K Sextet, for playing amazing jazz yesterday. Huge <laughs> respect to you. And Just Philharmonic Orchestra, who are not here. And Shadgit All Stars, who are also not here. But guys, we are on live video. Thank you so much. And, <laughs> and all, all dancers. Uh, this is the end <laughs> of 2017 edition. Thank you. <laughs>